hey everyone back again last time i said i was in florida what the hell's wrong with me california look once the tropical california not florida the, i'm losing it i've also never explained the base and superstructure idea which is like super important if you're learning about marx and critical theory and post marx marxists and whatever so yeah i'm gonna explain the base and superstructure today but before jumping into it hi i'm david I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, like, share, subscribe, you'll see videos I release every week, or at least we'll try to. I swear I have something cooking that you will all either hate or love, but you'll want to tune in for it. It'll come eventually. Now, you can follow me on other platforms, Instagram, X, TikTok, whatever you like. Uh, links for all such things in the descriptions. Uh, you can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but no pressure to do that. You know, liking, sharing, subscribing does does wonders for me. And yeah, let's just talk about the base and superstructure. Now, because I think it's embarrassing, uh, I, I was like, I'm going to make a visual aid. Not accounting for the fact that the camera flips everything. But I drew, I drew a base and superstructure, which you can see. I mean, how cute am I? How cute is this? With the base... And the superstructure but this is the idea within marxist analysis from his critique of political economy but we find it throughout all of his work really is that society can roughly be divided into two segments there's the economy specifically the economic basis upon which everything else can grow and then there's everything else culture society religion politics all of these things really simply depend upon value being extracted from the economy creating wealth so that people aren't spending all their time doing stuff like procuring food hunting and gathering so that they can actually like have there's some amount of surplus and people are out doing things that aren't about just satisfying immediate needs doing stuff beyond the economy and this group grows that is the superstructure on top grows as the economy grows and there is more wealth being made so that people can do all this other stuff now if you're listening to this and you're like clearly already versed in marxism i'm going to sound like a like a essentially a vulgar capitalist right now but it really it's good to know right off the bat that that's what it is the base superstructure dynamic but within marxism the point is actually very different and that is that within this this structure can be used to understand the way in which one group of people, that is the working classes that belong to the economic sphere and that comprise the vast majority of all people, do not just create value neutrally in that space. Instead, value is created there through their exploitation. And it is only upon exploitation, not the nebulous, you know, humanely described just random creation of wealth that happens in the economy. It is through their exploitation that value is created through surplus value to create the superstructure to permit things like society and culture to form. And this is the fundamental basis upon which society really rests. However, within this dynamic, within the base superstructure dynamic, where the base is like the bottom of the pyramid, superstructure is the top. You cannot really have one without the other. I mean, they very much go hand in hand. The distribution between them can certainly change. More of an emphasis on the economy, more of an emphasis on working people, paying working people more, emphasizing what can be satisfied in the economy versus finding, you know, finding realization in the superstructure, in the world of art and culture and society. Not to say that one is necessarily a better avenue to realizing human potential, but in any case, these things, you know, they go on. Now, Marx was not the only one to write about this. Figures like Antonio Gramsci and then Louis Althusser, I would argue, also very much take up this topic. Specifically for Gramsci, he was interested in the way that people do not resist their exploitation, do not fight against the capitalist system itself. And he says that that is because within the superstructure, where we find religion, politics, education, society, there are mechanisms put in place in order to coerce people to follow certain orders, to normalize the capitalist system, to normalize their own subordination. 
Some of these include like education in which people are taught how to be proper active political agents in the world, or in the case of like religion, or for, you know, to this day, religious institutions tell us that the key to virtue, to salvation, is to be a hard worker, of course, priming you for a life of endless toil and suffering for somebody else's profit. Now, these are the ways in which the eventual revolution is like staved off. People become complacent, they're taught to be complacent and to naturalize and normalize this system. Now, someone like Louis Althusser says something very similar. He identifies various different sources of power, what he identifies as ideological state apparatuses and repressive state apparatuses that both belong to the superstructural element. Ideological state apparatuses are like school, government, hospitals, the bureaucracy, that do not control people through direct, direct, like overt physical means, but instead do so by keeping track of them, managing them, directing them. He contrasts this with, or says they work alongside repressive state apparatuses that are those more overt forms of control, prisons, police, army, and so on, that you know will step in when the ideological state apparatuses are no longer equipped to deal with civil unrest, for example. So these are just a few different perspectives about the, on the base superstructure dynamic, how they work together, and how the capitalist relations of production are normalized in the superstructure to keep the economy going. Now in the future, who knows? Maybe there will be a perfect meeting of the base and superstructure where our economic goals happen to perfectly match our ideological ones, those that exist in the superstructure, so that as humans we actually attain everything that we need so that we pursue things that will move us forward in time, historically, that will make it so that the most amount of people can live the most happily for the least amount of work. You know, I, I don't actually know what it'll look like. I'm not, I'm not living in the future. But these are just some possibilities about what it might look like. And I'd love to hear what you have to say. I mean, what do you think it'll look like? What is an eventual endpoint here. Have I mischaracterized the base and super superstructure dynamic? Is there anything about it that I really should have included here? I'd love to know about it. And yeah, you know how to leave comments, like fill me in. I love reading all your comments. I don't have the time to respond to all of them, but I, I read them all, guarantee. I read them all and I'd love to hear what you have to say or see what you have to say. And on that note, like what I did, like, share, subscribe and take care.